Hey, I'm speaking with uh, Derek Wayne Johnson right here. How you doing? I'm great, man. How are you? Great. Uh, and you've made a really interesting documentary called King of the Underdogs, which is about the director, John Avildsen. And uh, I thought it was really excellent. Uh, it's a really great look at his career and his impact. And it has appearances by Sylvester Stallone, Burt Young, Martin Scorsese, Lloyd Kaufman, Ralph Macchio. And uh, well, like I said, I thought it was really great comes out uh today august 1st um and uh we've emailed each other for a while now about this and um because you've been working on it for uh, a few years now right yeah yeah about three years um like it's crazy i, I didn't know it would you know i didn't know it was going to last this long but uh, it's just been an incredible journey to like you said all the people you named to just get to work with everyone and uh just bizarre man yeah and I guess we got to get out of the way real soon. And for everybody listening, uh, in case you didn't know, uh, John Avildsen passed away this past uh, June. Um, and uh, the documentary uh, was you pretty much like in your final stages of it, right? Yeah. He, you know, it's very unfortunate that he died a month and a half before this release. I mean, but it, so it's bittersweet that we're finally here and now we can show the world. But, you know, John... He got to be a part of this thing. Um, he was in my life for five years and three years of this documentary. So he got to see it several times in sold out theaters with raving crowds and just, you know, he felt the love and he was proud and he also was very hands on, not in an overshadowing way, but what better person to get notes from than the great John Avildsen. So he was very, you know, pretty much the only thing he missed is the release. And so it's bittersweet, but we're glad that we're here. We just miss him. I mean, we had like our world premiere back in February in a, at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. We flew Ralph Macchio out for our special guest. And it was just like Tamla Tomito from Karate Kid 2 was there. And like just all these people like we brought back to be around John and to like experience this movie with him. And he was just delighted. And uh, it was just a wonderful experience. Specifically, Tamlin, he hadn't seen her since Karate Kid 2 and until this documentary. And there's just so many people like that that he just like Talia Shire, for example. She's like, you know, we live just a couple of miles away, but we never see each other. And this film really brought people back into his life. And he was just delighted. Uh, and you'll see in the film that everyone just has really great things to say about him, except, you know, Burt Reynolds. But, uh, you know, Burt Reynolds doesn't have... Nice things to say about a lot of people. But so you, you have to see the movie to see what I'm talking about, of course. Yeah, it's interesting the way life works that way sometimes. Yeah, you know, it's like, well, as you know, it's a, it's a big family while you're filming, right? While you're making the movie, you're like the tightest of tight, pretty much. And then when the movie's done, everyone goes their separate ways. Maybe you'll do a sequel. We know John and Sly did a sequel together, a little movie called Rocky Five. And... But through the years, you know, some do stay in touch and some don't. Some stay connected. I mean, like John and Sly would, they would see each other through the years. And uh, there's a lot of funny stories that they both have told me when they would meet up. How like, you know, like Ralph and John were still really close. Um, the Cobra Kai guys are all like this fraternity of, of best friends. So it's just really crazy how like they make these movies. Some go their separate ways and some are just buddies for life. Really cool seem a lot a lot of times that the people you work with are the people who you know you, you see the most often because you're working with them but then a lot of times like yeah there's a lot of people I just don't see you know so when you go into a documentary film it's usually a lot more footage than a you know a narrative film you probably have to shoot a lot of footage uh, so I was just curious as to like how'd you come up with the idea and like what motivated you into going all the way with it like this you know, this is one of my favorite stories. Uh, so five years ago, I tracked down John Avildsen, who, for the record, is my film hero. I mean, Rocky and the Karate Kid are my two favorite movies of all time. And so, like, I tracked him down, and I sent him this heartfelt email. It was like half fan, half business, you know? And he emailed me back, and it just said, Yo, Derek, what can I do for you? And I was like, oh, he's responding. So we started this friendship, and I actually didn't live in Los Angeles at the time. I live here now, but I was living back home in the South, if you can't tell with the accent. And I'm like, 
oh my God, like I'm, I'm, I'm talking to John Appleton. So I uh, offered him a script to direct. Why not, right? And he says, look, I get a lot of scripts, all right? So you do this. You send me a check for $1,000 and the script. If I like it, I'll do it. If I don't like it, I promise that I will script doctor it for you and make it better every page. If that's worth a thousand bucks, you're in business. So I was like, all right, wrote the check, sent the script. Two weeks later, I get a phone call from John and I'm like, whoa. And the first thing he says was, Derek, John Avildsen, listen, uh, get a pen and paper. Your script sucks. Let's talk about it. And I'm like, oh, so then we talked for three hours and he really followed through on his promise and he even mailed me the script back with handwritten notes on every page. Worth a thousand bucks, right? So then I fly out to meet with him. And we met for three hours. And it was just this amazing experience. Like we shed tears together, uh, which sounds really weird, but we were talking about the scene in The Karate Kid where Miyagi is drunk and uh, Daniel puts him to bed. Well, that, I was telling him how much that scene means to me, and he started crying because it means a lot to him. And so we're just crying, you know, really bizarre. So I felt really connected to him. So I offered him another script right there at the table. He didn't charge me this time, of course. But he turned me down again. All right, so now I'm devastated. Two scripts, $1,000, a plane ticket to L.A., shed some tears with my hero. Now it's like, what do I do? So then I get off the plane, and I call him, and I go, John, if I can't make a movie with you, what if I make a movie about you? And he says, you want to work with me, kid? That's it. You're in. And then I had to follow through. So here we are all these years later, and, and we did it. So that's literally how it came about. It just was like, I really, really wanted to work with John Avildsen, and he gave me the treat of a lifetime. Wow, that's awesome. One of the cool things about him is that he kind of seems like a little bit of like, you know, he, he has a little bit of an unknown factor, you know, like even address it in the documentary, how like uh, most people know who Stallone is, but they don't know who John Avildsen is. And uh, I remember... The only time I've ever seen him in real life was at um, it's it's in the the documentary also that, um, when he accepted that uh, that award uh, at the art museum steps in 2014, and it was like when they were coming out with the Rocky uh, heavyweight collection. I guess it was the new Blu-ray set or whatever. And I remember it was just him standing on the steps, and I was just sitting on the steps just watching uh, the whole thing you know happen. And it was just like nobody was there. It was just like maybe. Like ten people were standing around, and they were they were asking him some questions and uh, taking some pictures of him. But it was just so weird just to be sitting there, just on the steps, just watching him, and like nobody was there really. And uh, I mean, it was kind of secretive. They didn't really um, like announce it much. They didn't like publicize it a whole lot. Um, so yeah, he does have kind of like that underdog quality. So I think it was just perfect to like, and just like what timing, like to you know. Uh, let more people know about who he is and there's a lot of stuff in the documentary I didn't know about like uh, when Martin Scorsese was saying that on the film uh, Smiles um, it was a John Avildsen film but uh, Martin Scorsese had like a what, like a production assistant role or something I didn't know about this Martin Scorsese relationship yeah. until the movie happened I don't think anyone does really but yeah you'll find out in the film Martin Scorsese was a production assistant on his first paying gig ever on a John Avildsen short film. I mean, it's incredible. And, and then they both went on to do big things, right? So uh, we have Martin Scorsese in there talking about John Avildsen giving him his start. He literally gave him his first job on a professional film shoot for the short film, which you'll find out about in the movie. And so John was like, you know, you should ask, uh, you know, Marty. And I'm like, Marty's, oh, Scorsese. I'm like, oh, you know him? He's like, well, we used to know each other. I gave him his first job. And it's like, oh my gosh. And then Scorsese was so nice to be a part of our documentary and, and to talk about that. So that's something that no one really knows and it's just mm -hmm. golden and it's exclusive for our film. It just blows my mind. Yeah, and also the other things I was wondering if they were exclusive. There's a lot of behind the scenes footage, um, a lot of uh, stuff from the Rocky films um, that I've never seen before. Like there was the footage of them filming the ice rink and... Uh, uh, there's that, that shot, the, the iconic shot on top of the art museum steps when he's raising his arms. Uh, it's weird to see that with a camera crew behind him. I've never seen that before. So uh, did you have to dig up a lot of that stuff? 
Well, some of it is on the like Rocky Blu-rays DVDs. Some of it, uh, like the the making of and all that stuff. But we do have exclusive footage that John didn't give up to MGM to uh, use in those special features that we have. So, for example, uh, the the stuff that you're talking about with him on the camera with the you know the arms in the air, in the air that actually is on the uh, the heavyweight edition or whatever it was called uh, Blu-ray. How that came about was Lloyd Kaufman, whom you know, of course, and had on your show, uh, found all of this footage that his guy shot that sat in his vault at Troma for 40 years. And so, you know, they gave that to MGM and Lloyd gave it to us. So that's where that came from. But a lot of the other stuff John just had. John opened up all of his vault to us, pretty much, of footage and up until like our premiere, he was still giving me footage that he was finding. So Rocky stuff, Karate Kid stuff, like footage from Save the Tiger from like on set there. And it was just, he literally has tapes, hard drives and film reels in his house. And it was just amazing that we got to play with all of that. I mean, we had like a hundred hours of footage in this thing that we got down to 78 minute film. So just really insane how it's just a treasure trove of John Abelson and Rocky and the Karate Kid that a lot of it hasn't been seen before. Wow. That, that helps. That connects the dots with a lot of other things too. Like I heard about uh, Lloyd with the, some of the footage. I wasn't sure what it was specifically, but uh, um, also I didn't, I wasn't aware that the ice rink was originally meant to be in Philly. So I, I learned that, um, that it was supposed to be there and then um, they had to go out to LA and then they couldn't get enough extras, so it was John Avildsen's idea to say, like, well, how about it's closed? And today, I can't imagine that scene any other way. That, it's, that's the way the scene is. And that's how great of a craftsman and just a quick thinker that John was. I mean, uh, he was all about charm. That was a key word with John, is charm. So he felt that made the scene more charming. Uh, he said that when he was reading the script for the first time, five minutes in, this guy's talking to his turtles, Cuff and Link, and he's like, I'm charmed by this guy, Rocky Balboa. So if you look at John's films, they're, they're very charming. The characters are charming. I mean, who's not charmed by Mr. Miyagi and the Karate Kid? So yeah, you just there's so many little tidbits that John talks about, a lot of which we have heard, but then a lot of which we haven't heard. And the thing is about John is so many, if you look at a lot of these documentaries that are out there, they kind of like run over John. They kind of like just, he's like there, but not. This documentary is like, look, he's the director of Rocky. He won the Oscar. He did this, this, and this. He's responsible for this, this, and this. And you hear Sly and Talia and Bert and Carl and all these guys say it. And uh, I think this is finally a chance for Rocky fans and Karate Kid fans and all these guys to, and Abelson fans to just go, hey, this guy really did put his stamp on this, on these movies, but stood back in the shadows and let the movie speak for themselves. He was an incredible guy and an incredible artist. And he had some yeah. crappy movies too. Uh-huh, <laughs> but you know, that, that always happens. But yeah, some of the best artists to me are always like kind of faceless. It's sort of like the art is what comes first. Um, but uh, what are some of your favorite directing choices of his? Like, like just to get it started, like the one that sticks out to me is when um, it's in the first Rocky when... Um, uh, when Mickey and Rocky get into that argument in the uh, in, in his apartment, he comes to him to be his manager, and then he's like, "Well, you know, where were you before?" And then, and then you know they have that argument. Mickey leaves, and then when Rocky goes over and then goes to shake his hand, he chose to shoot it in this like long shot, like all the way from across the street, um, and you, all you see is them just go up and shake hands way in the distance, and you know exactly what happens. And I always thought that was such a great moment there. Um, so do you have any like, uh, shots like that would have been, you know, other directors would have probably shot it another way, but his choice to do it was just, you know, like a, a better choice. Absolutely. And it's so great that you, that you pointed that out. Cause again, it just, it, it says so much in that shot. Um, yeah, there's so many directing choices. A little backstory there is, you know, these being my favorite films and John being pretty much my favorite filmmaker. I grew up studying these films and I was kind of like an unofficial student of, of his, if you think about it. And then later in life, I got to be mentored by him. So we talked a lot about these things. We talked about camera placement. For example, in Rocky, 
the book that, that Apollo Creed flips through to find the Italian stallion, you see that book earlier. It's placed in the foreground and it says the ring. Uh, it's, that's the name of the book. You see that earlier in, um, in uh, the office of the pr flight promoter. So you see it, it's there, and then later you see them reading in it. And I, I've talked to John about that and he's like, yes, I put that there. It's just a little bit of foreshadowing. Um, there's also great shots like in The Karate Kid I love uh, when Miyagi is meditating and Daniel comes in and says, you know, I'm finished or whatever. I can't remember what chore he was doing at, at this point. And Miyagi's like sitting there in his Zen mode and you see Miyagi and then Daniel. And it's just like this really, the way he framed things. If you look at The Karate Kid, it's framed very much like it with Japanese art and symmetry. And it's all about, you know, he picked just these perfect angles. Another example is in the Karate Kid when uh, the mother and Daniel are talking at the restaurant. Uh, I'm sitting here animating, I guess. But, and in the background, you see the Cobra Kai, very small, running up, seeing him in the window, and then running back to tell their buddies. That sets up for the next scene when he's riding the bike and they follow him and throw him off the cliff. So like John had a really great eye in his films and those are just some of my favorite things that he did. And another thing that you'll learn in the film is in Rocky in round 14, which is my favorite scene in all of movie history. You see at the end of round 14 when Rocky's given Apollo two uppercuts, but it's four uppercuts. So what he did was there's, I believe it's a, I want to say it's a close up or, or a medium close of boom, boom. And then it goes to a wide, boom, boom. And it's the same take from two different cameras. So it's literally repeated. Now I noticed that as a youngster coming up going, wait a second, how do you do that and why? So we talked about it and he said, let's talk about it in the film. And you hear Sly and Carl talking about that. That's genius craftsmanship. That's taking a, a, a no budget movie and salvaging everything you have to make it work, and it works. And the average Joe doesn't notice it, but that's that, that means it did its job. And so he just has so many wonderful little things in there, the way he shot his films, that I don't feel are appreciative, appreciated as much as they should be. He made the best Rocky movie. I mean, I mean everything's you know subject to opinion, but... Uh... Like I mean, most people regard the first one as the best Rocky movie, and it, and it was not directed by Stallone. But then a lot of people regard Rocky Five as the worst. That always seems to be the uh, the worst one. And he also did that one. That's the only other one that he did. So it's interesting. I've always felt that he did everybody's favorite Rocky and everybody's least favorite Rocky. I was curious, what were your opinions on Rocky Five? Rocky Five is, you know, it's bad. But it's fun because, like, we grew up watching it, you know, on, on VHS and stuff. Um, John signed – you'll learn in the film, if, and this is general knowledge, so it's not totally exclusive to the documentary. But you'll learn that, uh, you know, he signed up for something different on Rocky V. Uh, I don't want to give too much away. You know, watch the film uh, and, and you'll learn. But what he signed up for didn't happen. was taken away from him. So it completely changed the ending and the story. I think so I know what you after, mean, yeah. Yeah, yeah, after John started filming. And uh, that was very disappointing to John. So that, that changed the movie for sure. But he also had a director's cut, aside from that monumental script change. He had a director's cut that I've seen that's fantastic. I mean, it's really good. But it's somewhere out there. Like, you can find it, but, you know, you can't find it on DVD or anything. Like, it wasn't released. But yeah. I've seen it. It's really good. And it just shows, you know leave the director alone sometimes, you know? Um, and that just didn't happen. So Rocky V is a disappointment. He was very disappointed in it. And, um, you know, I mean, these things happen. It was number five. I don't, you know, if you look at like uh, any, like A Nightmare on Elm Street 5, it's terrible. Yeah. Or like when you get to five, it's like, yeah. Ah. Yeah. Except with Rocky. Six was good. Seven, Creed yeah. was really good. Yes. I mean, like Sly really really went in there and, 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 and fixed some mistakes, so to speak, you know? Um, cause now it, it's just like, like Rocky five is like a pimple. It's fine. It just, it's just there and it's, you know, it's fine. Yeah. I love the street fight though. 
Yeah. And a lot of people were like, oh, he should have fought in the ring. It's like, it's the fifth movie. I, let's see him fight on the street. Let's see something different, you know? Yeah. And a lot of people rip on Tommy Morrison. Man, Tommy Morrison was really good. He was a, he was not an actor. He was a heavyweight. He was 20 years old. When he gets when he rages in that film, I'm mm-hmm. deathly afraid of him. You know, yeah, like, he's amazing as Tommy Gunn in that fight. Yeah. Like, that whole sequence at the end, my ring's outside. Like, that whole thing is just... It's fun. It's really fun. Yeah. Also on the Karate Kid side of things, um, another moment that just stuck out with me is that Miyagi winking. And I didn't know that that was really like a push. That was like uh, to get that shot in there, they had to go back and reshoot. And, and John really wanted it in there. It was like a big thing. And I'm so glad it is in there because that's like, that just is one of those things that just like makes the movie, that that wink. Absolutely. Um, it it. it he, you see in our film, he really fights. You'll see him tell the story of how he fought to get that shot. And it, you'll also learn why and how he got it. it he, he was a man that listened to the audience. He listened to feedback. He wasn't just like this uh, you know, crazy like, oh, I'm not going to listen to anyone. If people had a good idea, he would go for it. And that's how that shot came about. You know, there's some really other really cool Karate Kid stuff in the movie. Like, for example, uh, Daryl Vidal. Who's a, who's a buddy, you know, he was like the cool karate fighter at the end, like the real martial artist in the movie with the cool kicks and stuff that fought Johnny Lawrence. Like he's in our film and he's talking about, you know, like he's the guy you'll find out on the stump doing the crane kick. He's Miyagi's double. And you'll learn all this stuff in the film and how that came about. And it's just really cool. And, and also like you'll see, I asked John one day, actually when we filmed his interview for the movie, I was like, have you ever done the crane kick? And he goes, I don't think I have. And I'm like, I got to get a photo of you posing in the crane kick. So John, an 80-year-old man at the time, like gets on like a chair and stands up and poses in the crane. And we put it in the movie. And it's just so charming to see him. He was so happy that he finally like got to do the crane kick. So there's so much like amazing, rich Karate Kid moments in the film. Uh, you know, we hit on Karate Kid one and Karate Kid two. We don't really hit on Karate Kid three, but uh, yeah, it's all it's all in there. We have a lot of crazy, amazing stuff, and we got to bring all these people back. And, and you know, and it's just it's like a Rocky Karate Kid explosion. You know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. was it hard uh, getting any of the you know the actors? No, no, it you know. All the actors were great. Uh, everyone that signed on, signed on immediately for John. For example, like Sly, the day we called him is the day he said yes. Like he didn't make us wait or anything like that. Um, we, there were some actors that don't appear in the film that we couldn't get. But it's not that they said no or they couldn't, they didn't want to do it. They just couldn't, you know, scheduling and, and location, stuff like that. But we pretty much flew around the United States Um Interviewing people, like I remember we interviewed Burt Young in New York, and he was like, hey, I've got some spaghetti, you would you let, sit down and eat, eat, and we're like, no, we're good, we're here just to film. We flew to Burt Reynolds' house in Florida and filmed him, and you know, he was such a gentleman. Um, I mean, really, Burt and John didn't really get along, but the respect that they have for one another, it shows in the film, both sides will show in the film. And, uh, you know, it's just crazy. Like we got to fly around and interview all these people and a lot of them have become friends or people that we're working with on other projects. So it's really bizarre. Um, but yeah, everyone, you know, they signed on for John and, uh, you know, everyone just had, it was hard to get people to say bad things about John, except Burt Reynolds, but yeah, everyone just respected him. It's interesting how there's an art of making sequels, like an art of continuing where the last one left off. And I know they did it in Rocky II first, which was uh, Stallone directed, but uh, how it had that recap of the, the fight from the first movie. Um, but then, then in Karate Kid 2, how like that is actually like it was originally going to be the end of Karate Kid 1. So they had it in there and it just it it picks up so perfectly from the first movie that I don't know, just that way of connecting movies seemed to become an art in itself and uh he perfected it with with karate kid too i think absolutely i mean and you'll learn in there why that was uh lifted from karate kid one to and put in karate kid two now it wasn't shot during the karate kid one 
they did come back uh, two years later to shoot it. Um, but yeah, you know, and then of course in three, they showed one again. So it was like the same opening as two. And it was just like really cool how they did that. And, uh, and you know, there's a lot of cool things that John Avildsen was responsible for. Like he's, he's not only like the king of the underdog film, which is why we named it king of the underdogs. We feel he's like, you know, Hitchcock's the master of suspense. Elvis is the king of rock and roll. We feel that John Allison is the king of the underdog film. But he's also the king of the montage. He's yeah. Especially the training montage. I, I should say that training montage. And the stand up and cheer movie. Uh, the stand up and cheer movie. Uh, the mentor uh, type film. I mean, the surrogate father type film. I mean, he's, you know, he really followed in Frank Capra's footsteps. And, you know, you'll find out in the movie a little bit about Frank Capra and John. Uh, I don't want to give too much away, of course, but John was just responsible for all of these cool things that he kind of revolutionized filmmaking and didn't really, other than winning an Oscar, didn't really like capitalize on it. He didn't, you know, it's really bizarre that this quiet little man did all of this stuff with no fanfare. But uh, with, with this though, I'm I'm sure he'll get a lot more recognition now. So this is really, uh, de- you know, it, it's really deserving. Uh, so uh, I guess one thing to end with is, uh, do you have any tips for anybody starting their own documentaries? Like any pitfalls? Yeah. <laughs> I could write a book, man. Yeah, uh, that's the way it goes. People ask me that kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, oh, I'm so sure much. you get so many, so many questions like that. Uh, yeah. You know, like, first of all, you know, know your subject, of course, be in love with your subject because you're going to be involved with this for a few years. I don't care what you say. You're not going to do this in six months. You're going to live with this thing for a while. And, uh, and also just, you know, get everything that you need. You can never have too much. You can have not enough. Um, but yeah, just go out there. Documentaries are hot, man. They're hot right now. Uh, they're everywhere. People were tired of CGI and big screen superhero movies. I mean, they're fun, but it's, it's like kind of getting old. People are starting to look for more intellectual type things and they're going to documentaries for that purpose because they're just not getting it that much in, in Hollywood. And uh, so go out there, find a subject that you love and, and, uh, and go for it. And, you know, obviously I'm, I'm pushing a product right now. I mean, buy our film, rent our film, tell your friends. Uh, I don't want to sound like a used car salesman, but the reason what I want people to do is go out there Learn about John Avildsen. Learn about the man behind your favorite films. I mean, even if you don't like his movies, you can at least learn film techniques and learn why he did things. And And we don't just talk about Rocky and the Karate Kid. We talk about all these films like Joe and Save the Tiger, Lean on Me. Um, these, You know, there's a lot of fascinating things in here that uh, I think film buffs, filmmakers, and just people should, should just watch and uh, appreciate a man who who unfortunately just passed away and isn't going to get to see the world embrace him once again. But I hope that they do. Absolutely. Yeah. And before I forget, uh, where can they see it? So you can, you can find the film um, on iTunes and digital download platforms. I mean, it's on DVD, it's on Blu-ray. Um, our distributor is Chassis Media. That's actually Adam Carolla, the comedian. Uh, it's his company. So you can find it on Chassis, C-H-A-S-S-Y, dot com. You can get the DVD, the Blu-ray, the digital download. It's out there on all the, the platforms. And, um, you know, just check it out. That, that's all we can ask. And it, I think it'll be a great way to uh, honor John. You can also find us on Facebook. Um, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at JGA Underdog. Um, we're there. And uh, we've got a film that we think that people should see. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, telling us more uh, info about it. And uh, yeah, everybody check it out. And thanks for having me on, man. Huge fan. I'll tell you, I discovered you when I was looking up the Karate Kid video game years ago. And that's how I came across you. So it's kind of cool that full circle that we get to talk about this stuff today. So I really appreciate it. Oh, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, very fitting. Yeah, yeah, yeah.